All right, well, welcome everyone. We're now at our fourth learning lab, and we're really excited about this one. We've got a special guest with us. It's Erin Liddell. She's with the H2O. She's the chief machine learning scientist there. And uh, today we're gonna be doing a hands-on demo, and it's gonna be a really fun lab. Um, I know a lot of you guys, uh, based on the feedback we got last time with the marketing analysis, that you guys really got excited about the live coding. So we're gonna be definitely making that a piece of this, but we're also gonna learn a lot about H2O, and I'm sure Aaron's got more to say about that here in a minute. So yes, this is gonna be hands-on coding. We're gonna be doing automatic machine learning in this. And with that, we'll get started. So just to remind you guys, uh, the structure is, we're gonna take for this one 60 minutes, roughly, to go through a presentation uh, in that presentation, we're going to be doing a lot of um, live coding, some slide decks. You're going to learn a lot about H2O. Uh, it will take about an hour. And then at the end, we're reserving 10 minutes for Q&A. But um, we're here to just kind of answer all of your questions, as many as we can, and we'll go longer if needed. Um, with that said, Aaron, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yeah, So, um, so Matt already said I, I'm the chief machine learning scientist at H2O and um, a little bit about myself. I have a background in statistics um, and machine learning and software development and um, I've been at H2O for about four years and so that's kind of since the company was very small and um, so yeah, I've been involved in, in the development of H2O open source platforms for a while, and now I focus mostly just on automated machine learning. So automating basically everything that we have in the open source H2O package. Um, I'll mention two other things. Uh, one, I, I uh, founded an organization called Women in Machine Learning and Data Science. So for uh, all the, the ladies and the uh, allies in the audience, um, if you're interested in coming to one of our meetups, you can uh, go to wimmelds.org. And I'm also pretty involved um, and helped co-found the, the Our Ladies Global Organization. So that's just a little shout out for uh, my other side projects. So for any of you that don't know Erin, you definitely need to follow her. Erin, um, is there any way that um, you would recommend people getting in touch with you? Um, yeah, I guess uh, Twitter is a good place. Um, LinkedIn is probably the worst place, but you can also add me on LinkedIn. I just might not see a message. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can always send me an email at Aaron at h2o.ai is my um, professional email address if you would like. Very cool. Well, uh, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, David, you just want to intro yourself real quick? Yep. Hey guys, uh, David Curry. Um, I have a, a marketing business and we do uh, marketing analytics along with search engine optimization and some other digital marketing related stuff. Um, and happy to be here with you guys again. So thanks for joining. And you guys know me. I'm Matt Dancho. I am the founder of Business Science. I'm an instructor at Business Science University. And I'm just excited to help you guys learn data science. So with that, Let's get started. Um, for the materials that we're gonna be using for this presentation, I do wanna um, show you guys where they're located. However, what I do recommend is let's wait until after the presentation is over to go download these. The reason being is that if we're trying to do it right now, it's gonna detract and you're, and you're gonna miss stuff that Aaron's showing you and that we end up showing you. So uh, really probably the best thing to do is watch this uh, presentation and then um, we're also recording it so you're gonna have recordings slide decks you're gonna have links to all the material coming to you through email uh, so you will get all the contents here so um, after this presentation when you guys want to go and download this uh, this is the link you're gonna go to it's the github for business science and then slash presentations and then we're actually using the same uh, business problem from last week. So that was the marketing analysis case study. And um, so, it, so all of the contents will be in this learning lab folder. So it's uh, the 2019-13 learning lab marketing analytics. Um, so that's where you'll go to. And then in there, 
Um, you'll have the data that, that we'll be going through for the live demo. Um, you'll have the slide deck that Aaron shows you, the slide deck that I show you, and eventually we'll have the video on YouTube as well. So um, this, this slide, what we're gonna do is just real quick recap what we did last week. So uh, the last learning lab was, uh, we had this business problem. It was a marketing analysis that we went through. It was actually an Excel to R conversion. So the business process was in this Excel spreadsheet. There was a bunch of tabs. Um, these purple tabs here contained the, um, the various spreadsheets for uh, the clients, that the loan history, the marketing history. It was for a bank, which was the company, and what they were trying to do was to measure and predict the enrollment and term deposits. So they had a bunch of different features, data that they collected on all of their different customers, and what they were trying to do is um, see if there was any relationship to um, whether or not these customers were enrolling in those products. So that product was called a term deposit, and it's like a CD, um, so basically a, a product that a bank offers. Um, the second goal, of this project was to explain why. So also um, to understand which features and what that bank can do about those features in order to be able to uh, better gain new customers and, and keep existing. So that's just a recap. Um, it's a marketing problem for a bank. So um, with that, the agenda for today, so this one's gonna be a lot of, of uh, hands-on. It's gonna be with Erin. She's got a, a nice presentation. Uh, there's gonna be a live coding demo as well. Um, she's gonna teach you all about H2O. And um, at the end, what we'll do is we'll wrap it up with a plan to learn how to learn H2O. So we're gonna give you a step-by-step -step plan. All right, so with that, Erin, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, so... Um just look at the time so that I know. Uh, okay. So, um, so I've given, you know, I've given this uh, talk before. And so if you've, if you've seen any um, videos about H2O AutoML, some of this will be hopefully, um, you know, not new. So, but I did change the uh, picture on the front of my slides today. So that's new. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say that logo looks nice. <laughs> Yeah, that came from Google Images last night. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a refresh here. So anyway, um, what we're gonna talk about today is um, all of these things. So scalability with machine learning and H2O, we're gonna talk about what automated machine learning is and then how to do that within H2O itself. Um, so, so yeah, the title, Scalable Automatic Machine Learning in H2O. And so what I'm gonna first tell you about is just what is what is H2O. So it's it's can be confusing to people because it's two things. It's the name of the company that I work at, and um, the company is headquartered in Mountain View, California, and it's been around since 2012. Um, I I joined there in 2015, um, and it was started by engineers really. So so sort of some very hardcore Java engineers, and, and so not, not statisticians or data scientists. So, so from the beginning, the focus has always been engineering, and um, try, the, the goal was kind of to, to build a very solid enterprise grade, um, sort of equivalent of scikit-learn or something like this. So a platform that um, can work on big data sets in a distributed manner, but has a whole bunch of different machine learning algorithms that, that you would want to use, and then all the other types of functionality around that. Um, and so it's open source, it's Apache 2.0, so if you are not familiar with different open source licenses, that's pretty much the most liberal license, which means you can build on top of it, you can use it in your business in whichever way you want, you could make a business on top of it, some people have done that. Um, and, uh, and so it's all written in Java, but uh, we have interfaces in R, Python, and you, of course, if it's in Java, you can use it in Scala. Um, and we also have a web interface for people who, you know, don't want to write code or just, you know, not in the mood. So, um, so that's what H2O is. And then just now to, it's also, you know, a little bit confusing because H2O was used to be the only thing that we would 
produced, but now we have a, a few other tools. So we have something called sparkling water, which is a, the spark package that lets you use H2O. Um, we have something called H2O for GPU, which is a completely separate code base from H2O. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not sort of like adding GPUs to the existing H2O. It's, a com it's rewriting all the algorithms from scratch so that they work on GPUs. Um, and then, so those, you'll see those in white, the two ones with the black background, those are uh, proprietary tools. So those are not open source. So that we have something called driverless AI, which is essentially another auto ML system, but with uh, some extra things. It's also a completely separate code base. It's not like an, um, you know, an enterprise version of what we have in the open source. And it's more focused on GPUs and um, one of the key differentiators is that it has automatic feature engineering, which is um, kind of this highly valuable, very manual skill that uh, we've hired Kaggle grandmasters to figure out and automate. And then there's something called Steam, which is um, for deploying uh, H2O. And there, you, there is actually an open source version of Steam, but then there's a closed source which is kind of a separate product. That's confusing too. Um, all right, so now you have the lay of the land. Um, so um, since this is a business science course, I just wanted to mention like, here's some of the places that are using H2O that we can talk about. So just a bunch of different industries. Um, these are a list of our customers. So um, it's not all of our customers, but uh, just, a, a, just an example of how it's being used in industry kind of, in a lot of different places. Yeah, you'll see finance there. Finance is a big one. Um, and then also, uh, I know when I went to, um, I did a workshop with S&P Global here recently, but they loved H2O um, and they're in the, the financial space. So I can definitely see that as being a big, uh, big driver there. I'm not surprised you have a, a ton of companies, but yeah, very cool. Yeah, so I mean, one, one thing that's nice about H2O is that it's open source, so you're, you're not uh, beholden to sort of a cloud provider to have all your data and have control. So that's one of the reasons that we see that, you know, industries like healthcare and finance and people that are a little bit more controlling about their data and, and just having ownership. Um, Okay, so this is kind of an overview of, of what we're gonna talk about today. And so this is a hands-on um, session, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll do slides for like half the time and then we'll jump over to the code and then we'll come back to the slides and then at various points we can also answer questions. Um, okay, so I'll just start out a little bit more about what H2O is and, and why, well, how is it different from other tools that are similar. So um, the first big difference is that it's uh, a distributed machine learning system, which means that it can be run um, both multi-core on your machine, your single machine, which many machine learning systems can do, but um, one unique property is that it also could be on multi-nodes. So if you have a very large cluster, let's say on EC2, on Amazon, um, you know, and your data doesn't fit into one node, let's say you have a terabyte size training set, well, unless you, you know, they, well, they used to not even make machines with that much RAM, now they do, but, um, but usually you need more than the size of your data to even do anything with, with the data. So, so the idea would be then uh, we can do machine learning by um, uh, distributing the data um, across multiple nodes and um, so that's kind of what I mean by multi-node. Um, a lot of people just use it on their laptop and they don't care about any of this stuff. If, you know, if you're dealing with training sets that are a few gigs or even 50 gigs or 100 gigs, that's all stuff that can be easily done on one machine. You don't need to set up a cluster. Um, and I mentioned before, everything's written in high performance Java. And sometimes people ask why Java and not C++. And that's because... Um, the co-founder of H2O is a guy named Cliff Click, and he's sort of a, a big Java guy. And he, um, he's well known for inventing something called the Java Hotspot Compiler, which, which is something that made Java fast and performant um, back in the day when he worked at Sun. So that's why Java. Um, and so then, yeah, if you're, you know, but that's, 
most data scientists either don't like Java or they don't know Java or, you know, it's not of concern to them. So that's why we have the APIs available in R and Python, because those, of course, are the two main languages that people would would use H2O with, and that's kind of our target audience as data scientists, also engineers. Yeah, and just, just to that point, Aaron, um, R and Python, you'll find that pretty much like any high performance language um, or any high performance tool is, is either written in C++ or Java or something like that, and then you usually have R or Python has a, an API above that because these are a little bit slower languages. R and Python, they're, they're not pre-compiled. So Java is compiled, C++ is compiled. So that's, that's why you're getting a big speed boost. And that's why it is high performance. Yep, exactly. So even, even a lot of the R or Python packages that you would know and be familiar with have a, have a back end of C++ or even a lot of them in R have Fortran. Um, so, um, okay. So then the other thing, we, we built this as a company from the beginning. So it wasn't an open source project that then became a company. The goal from the beginning was to have a self-sustaining company around this open source platform. So one of the things that we aimed to do was to make, make, make this code um, easily deployable to production. Because when you have code in production, that's when people are more interested in paying for things like enterprise support. So, um, so that's kind of the goal. You don't need to rewrite your models in a high performance language after writing them in R or Python. It just exports immediately to Java code and you can put it right in, directly into production. And originally at the time of the company was started, um, Hadoop was really, really popular and Spark didn't exist. So it was first meant to be a sort of a machine learning library on top of Hadoop because in those days, people weren't talking about AI, they were talking about big data all the time. That was the hotness of 2012. <laughs> so, um, so that was the goal. And then of course, Spark came along, then we rewrote H2O from scratch so that it would work with Spark and Hadoop. It also works just on your laptop, like you mentioned, you don't have to use any of those tools if they're not already necessary and part of your workflow. Um, Okay, and so I'm just gonna, this is probably the most technical slide that I have. This is just explaining some of the concepts that we have with, with H2O as a distributed computing system. So this is just sort of nomenclature. So we have something that we call the H2O cluster. And the first thing you do in any R, R Python um, H2O script would be starting up the H2O cluster. So there's a, just a little function that does that. And what that really means is that you're just starting up a Java process where all the, uh, you know, um, all the computations are going to happen, all the data is going to live in there. It's just a, um, a block of memory where all the models and the data lives and all the computations happen. So that's what we mean when, we, when we're referring to the H2O cluster. And there's no limit on the size of the cluster. It could be on your single, you know, laptop or it could be across like a very large uh, network of physical uh, machines, a physical cluster. Everything we'll be showing today is local. That's right, Aaron? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like I said, most of the time, you know, you don't need these things. It's just good to have and you don't have to switch over to some other different system when you're ready to scale or, you know, ready to try new use cases on bigger data sets. Um, and then there's something that we call the H2O frame. This is basically just a data frame. So if you're in R, we have data.frame or data.table, or now we have tibbles. Um, basically the same thing. Just underneath the rows, could, if, if you're using multiple um, nodes, some of the rows would be on one node, some of the rows would be on another one. So underneath it's distributed, but when you're dealing with it in R or Python, you don't know that and you don't need to know that. It's just something to, to be aware of. Um, and also in Python, it would work just like a pandas data frame. We try to keep basically exactly the same syntax as data frames in R and Python pandas. You know, not all the functionality is, is implemented, but we, we, we don't want to make you learn a new way of slicing frames and doing things with data. Um, and the other thing is a lot of people just have their existing maybe dplyr or uh, code in R or um, you know, pandas code in, in, in Python. And then once they've done all their munging or slicing or whatever, then they can take that data frame and just turn it into an H2O frame. So you can either do the operations in parallel on a big distributed system, or you can just do it in R or Python. And then once you're ready, 
send it over to the H2O cluster. Okay, so I'm gonna end with all the technical stuff and now we're gonna get on to some more fun things. Okay, so overall, what is, what is H2O uh, machine learning? Well, it's a group of supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithms. Um, some things that, that are nice about H2O, I think, um, in comparison to some other libraries is that we do a lot of the sort of boring work, uh, pre-prep that you have to do with data um, to use machine learning algorithms automatically. So like if you have missing data, we'll fill that in for you. Um, if the columns need to be normalized and they do with some algorithms, we would do that for you. You don't have to think about that or know about that. If you have categorical data, you can pass it directly to H2O. You don't have to do any one hot encoding or anything like that. And actually all of our tree-based algorithms don't require that. That's, um, we do something called group splitting with our trees. So we actually can make more use of the data by having all the categories together at once. Um, and you get better performance that way a lot of the times. Um, automatic early stopping. So this is to prevent overfitting. So you know when you're training, let's say a GBM, one of the things that you can do is you can overfit the GBM if you don't, if you, if you have too many trees and then you get poor performance. So we want to make that a little bit easier. So we have something called early, automatic early stopping. Um, then of course we have all the other things that go along with machine learning like cross validation, grid search, random search. Um, and once you have the models, we will do variable importance. We'll give you um, model evaluation metrics and we'll do plotting. So just kind of all the scaffolding that goes along with with doing data science, we try to provide within the H2O package so you don't have to piece together a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, one, one of the things that I love about it, and um, this is kind of just my personal opinion, is there's a lot of stuff that goes into data science that if you don't do, uh, if you don't follow perfectly the workflow from pre-processing, then doing cross-validation, and then, you know, and, and making sure that you split up the test sets just the, you know, into the, your training and tests and your validation sets like H2O handles almost all of that for you. Um, in fact, the cross validation piece, uh, it really makes it just so simple that you just provided a data frame and it's already going to do the cross validation for you. Uh, the, the grid search for the, the best parameters and so on. So it really makes things to be honest, a lot easier. And you're going to see that in the code today. Yeah, so for example, cross-validation is just one single argument. Nfold equals whatever, five, 10, and then it will do all the cross-validation and splitting for you. So that's super, uh, when, I, when I switch over to other libraries, either for benchmarking purposes or other exploration, I sometimes am like, oh my gosh, I have to do all of this <laughs> from scratch. I'm dealing with that right now, so. <laughs> yeah. So that's when I really appreciate it, because I've been working with H2O for so long, I forget what's out there. Um, okay, so now we'll move on. So the whole theme of this talk was is automated machine learning. And so we're going to talk about what does that mean and, and what can we do with it. Um, so here's kind of how I think about automated machine learning. So it's kind of the same way that you just think about the data science process itself or the machine learning process itself and then automation of all those parts. So there's certain aspects of data preparation that can be done automatically. Um, and I'll go into more detail on the next slide. Uh, then there's anything to do with the generating models. So that's also something that we want to be able to automate. Because um, that's, you know, if you're doing that manually, that can take a long time. And, and a lot of expertise to figure out which models to train and how to evaluate them. <clears throat> And then another aspect that I like to think about when, when thinking about automatic machine learning is, is really like what is, what is the goal of automatic machine learning? And I think that for me at least, the goal is to find the best model in the least amount of time or with the least amount of effort. And that could be, um, some people might also have different goals like I want the most interpretable model or something like that. But um, but for now, I'll kind of just focus on the goal of getting the best model. And um, so if you want to get the best model, really always the solution is ensembles. So with, with the AutoML um, world, like you could either focus on individual models or you can say, really my goal, I don't, um, 
you know, I just want the best model regardless of, of the complexity. So that would generally be an ensemble. And for any of you who have participated in, in Kaggle, you would, you would know that, that every Kaggle competition is, is won by an ensemble of some sort. And what, what ensemble means, if you're not familiar, is just taking a group of models and combining them together somehow to get a better model than you would have um, compared to any of the individual ones. So that's, that's the goal. Yeah, each, each of the different models are, have pros and cons, and, and they're, you know, they're going to be strong in certain areas and with certain data types, and then they're going to be weak with others. So what Aaron is saying is when you combine those, so maybe like a tree-based model with a linear model or with a deep learning model, you get the benefits of all three. And it's like a, it's, it's more than an additive too. It's like a, a one plus one equals, you know, 10 type, type thing. So. Yeah. So you might be overselling it a little bit, but it's. <laughs> maybe, maybe not what. Maybe it's, not it's, it's uh, you, you definitely get a better model. So that's, that's the goal. Um, okay. So this is just a little bit more. Um, I think my screen is probably cut off a little bit on the side with, with our faces or can you, can you not see, um, in my screen, I see all three of our faces on the right hand side. Are you not, is everybody? Yeah, I can that? see, yeah, I can see the full, um, the full okay. Spot. So that just yeah. must be on my, my end. Okay. So I'll just guess what's underneath. Um, so here's those three topics basically, uh, just laid out in more detail. So for, for data pre-processing, um, Here's some of the stuff that I, that I would consider to be aspects of automatic machine learning or things that could be automated. And right now, I'm just speaking generally. I'm not talking about H2O specifically. So this is just in general um, things that we can do in automatic machine learning. So I've already talked about the, the pre-processing stuff that we do in, in H2O. So that first bullet is basically stuff that we already do in H2O. Um, but all of that's very easy to automate. It's just a little bit of code. Then the next would be things like if you have very wide data or very sparse wide data, um, doing things like feature selection or feature extraction that could also be part of your data pre-processing um, workflow. And then there's all different types of things that you can do when you have categorical features. And um, for the most part, like if you just have a few categories in your column, you don't really need to do anything. However, if you have, um, you know, 50, 100, 3,000 different categories in your column, that's when that machine learning algorithms start to get sad, basically. <laughs> like they, you know, and depending on which software you're using, it could be, you know, even worse. So if you're using software where it requires uh, one hot encoding, what that means is if you have, um, 3,000 categories, one hot encoding that will convert that single column into 3,000 extra columns. And so what that's going to do is it's going to slow down your training. Um, some algorithms might just do poorly um, and, and sort of bad things happen. So um, the, the example that I like to use, which is kind of a common thing that you might see in, in data sets would be, uh, let's say you have a zip code uh, column. So zip code is actually a categorical feature. It's not numeric, even though it's represented that way, um, because it represents categories. And there's something like 40 or 50,000 zip codes in the US. This is um, uh, an example. So that's a very problematic type of column to have in your data set. And this is maybe like a normal thing. This isn't even that rare to see something like that. Um, so there's different types of encodings that you can do to what we would call this, this type of data would be called high cardinality. And that all that means is that there's a lot of categories in the single column. So there's, there's something called target encoding. It's also called impact encoding. Um, a lot of the stuff has like messy names because it's sort of not really developed in academia. It's sort of developed in industry or outside. So there's a lot of different names for the same thing. Um, so anyway, just, I'm not gonna go into details about what these things are, but just be aware that if you have high cardinality category and um, you would have to know what that is. So if we could automate that, that would be great. Um, so once, once you're kind of set with your data, then there's different ways to train a bunch of models. So the most straightforward way, which people are probably most familiar with would be called grid search 
or, or random grid search or random search. Um, that just means, you know, specifying um, or sort of selecting a handful of, of hyperparameters from your algorithm. So if you have random forest, let's say you select um, la, uh, M tri, which would be like the number of variables you randomly select at each uh, split point. You could, you could look at tree depth, you could look at other things like sample rate. Um, these names of the hyperparameters will all be different from software to software, but essentially the idea is, you know, you have some hyperparameters that you're, you're, and the goal is to find the values for those which give you the best model. And so if you just lay out a grid of all different combinations of values, then train a bunch of models, you're, you know, then pick the best one from that grid, then, um, you know, you're good to go. So that's just one way of generating models. Um, then there's another technique that's called um, Bayesian hyperparameter optimization. Um, and there's some newer techniques. Um, one's called hyperband, and then there's something that's a combination of the two called BHOB, which is, um, that's like NIP. NeurIPS 2018 research. So this is all very new. There's all different ways to sort of tune models and to create um, to create new models with the goal of, of finding the best one. And I'm not going to go into more detail about that. But um, then the last thing is ensemble. So once you have a big you know selection of models, you could you could ensemble all of them or some of them together. So there's um, the two techniques I think are worthy of pointing out. One is called stacking or super learning, and that's what we do at H2O. Um, and then there's another type of ensembling called, called ensemble selection. And that's sort of more of a greedy approach. Stacking is, is something where you actually use machine learning to learn what the best combination of the base learners would be. So there's two phases of machine learning. Ensemble selection is just a little bit more simple. Um, you just keep adding models, or there's another one where you keep deleting models until you get, you know, the performance st starts to get worse. Um, and in my experience, stacking works better on diverse set of models and ensemble selection maybe works, I don't know, better, but uh, performs better on, like, if you have more similar models to each other. That might be anecdotal, though. Okay, so... In terms of AutoML, that's, that's a pretty generic term. So there's a lot of people using it in different ways. So to disambiguate that the term AutoML, I wrote a blog post a few months ago, and that's uh, a link where you can find it if you look at the bottom of the screen. Um, and that, I think it's important to try to understand what, that, what the term means because there's, um, there's companies like Google, for example, has now come out with something that they call AutoML, and it's very different from what most of the AutoML um, world had been working on. So they're basically you can split up into, into two, two worlds of AutoML. One would be um, AutoML on complex data like images or video or text. And then you would use a deep learning approach. And what, what the goal with AutoML there is, is to, to figure out what the architecture of the neural network is. And that's basically what they're talking about when they say AutoML. And for every other type of data, so more business type of data where you're dealing with sort of like the equivalent of a spreadsheet or like a table where there's numbers or even, you know, categorical data. So probably what you're more used to, that would be um, another type of AutoML. That's kind of what I'm talking about today. And that could involve any, all, any or all of you know, machine learning algorithms that you're familiar with, like random forest, GBM. You can also use deep learning on that as well. Um, so, but yeah, just to clarify, yeah. Yeah, if you want to learn more. Yeah, and I, I would say what we're talking about here with the rectangular data sets, they kind of look like spreadsheets. That's what probably 99.9% .9 of machine learning that's being applied in business cases right now is being done with the H2O style of algorithm that works on the rectangular data. The, the text stuff, the video, the, um, you know, the, these are all kind of like more on the deep learning end. And that type of auto ML 
it's certainly going to be important in the future, especially as uh, we look to more alternative data sets that use text and video to be able to you know, get insights out of. But for right now um, in business, this is the auto ML that I would recommend learning. Yeah, certainly in this day and age, right, you know, today, more practical to, to learn this. Um, unless you happen to work at Google or Facebook or one of these um, advertising companies that have a lot of uh, video or, you know, whatever. So, but if you're dealing with um, traditional data, then, then you're going to be more, um, get more use out of a tool like H2 AutoML or really any of the other open source AutoML tools. Um, okay, so moving on. So what is H2O Auto ML? So here's just that same um, screen that we had before, but I'm highlighting what we have right now in, in the current stable release of H, H2O Auto ML, or in H2O, so that would be version 3.22. Um, so, and actually this is, more or less a roadmap as well of what we're adding. So we have right now just the basic data pre-processing on our roadmap and actually um, we, well, on our roadmap we have feature selection and feature extraction. I, that might not be in the next release. In the next release we will have um, target encoding of high cardinality categoricals. So that, that should be in 324, which will be you know, maybe out at the end of March or so. Um, and then right now we do random grid search with stacking. So, and I'll explain why. Well, I think, yeah, I'll explain why I think those things are work well together. Uh, in the future, we might add some different types of uh, model generation um, techniques. So, you know, things we consider, could consider are what I've already mentioned, Bayesian hyperparameter optimization, um, hyperband or BHOB which is a new method. Um, okay, so I'll explain why, why do we use this particular technique that we do. So one simple answer is we already had these things in H2O, so they, and they were ready to go. So we work with what we have. <laughs> but, um, but really, you know, they, they evolved out of, um, or this technique evolved out of like, you know, some s sensible thought as well. So, so basically, stacking works very well, I mentioned, if, if it's working on a diverse set of models. So, um, and if we want to be more specific about that or speak in, in a statistical language, we could say um, they perform well if the models are based on individually strong models that make uncorrelated errors. So essentially, when the models fail at predicting, um, we want them to fail in different ways. Because then if one model's failing, the other one can make up for it. So one way to get diversity among your set of models is to just randomly generate models. And that's just a very straightforward way to get diversity. And then um, in H2O, since we have a lot of different types of algorithms, we can just do random grid search across all the different types of models that we have. And so we have diversity in terms of the types of algorithms that, that are there. So random forest, GBM, deep learning, GLM, et cetera. And then we have variability even within each of those. And so that's, that's the approach that we use and, and it seems to work pretty well. Um, but again, that's, this is just our first approach. And as we, you know, maybe a year from now, we'll have something different or something in addition to what we have now. Um, so here's just an overview, basically, of, of H2O AutoML. So we have all the, the simple data pre-processing that we get for free because it's already included in the H2O algorithms. Um, we train random grids of all, uh, well, not, not, we actually don't train a random grid of random forests. We might add that, but all the other ones we do. Um, and then we individually tune the models uh, because we don't want the models to be overfit. So that's also very important. And once we have this you know, set of models, what we do at the end is we train two stack ensembles, one of all of the models. So that would be, we call that the all models ensemble. And then we have another one that we call the best of family ensemble. And the point of that one is not to make a better ensemble because it's not better. 
um, but it's more lightweight. So if you wanted to put it in, pro in production and you wanted to just have an ensemble of like five or six models instead of, you know, 50 or 100 or 1,000 models, uh, however long you want to run it for, um, you know, that would be something that would, uh, would be better for production use cases. Um, and then once the AutoML process is complete, what we give you back is what we're calling a leaderboard. And that would just be a ranking of all the models based on cross-validation performance. And, and we would return, you know, ranked by some default metric, but you can switch what the metric is. So if you have a binary classification problem, we would automatically rank by AUC unless, you know, you wanted to say log loss, then we would rank by log loss. So which, whichever you choose, it's, um, some, it's just a parameter that you can set. And then of course, these are just all H2O models, so they can be easily exported into production, including the stacked ensemble. Um, so here's what, what, what it looks like in R. So, um, so it's just a few lines of code. Well, the, the AutoML code itself is just one line of code, but uh, there's a few things that we do in H2O. So one I mentioned before, the first thing that you always do is start up the H2O cluster, and that's what we do with the h2o.init command. And you know, there's, there's arguments to that function. You can just use it uh, without any, but if you wanna give it more memory, that's when you would pass uh, a memory argument. If you wanted to start it up or, and connect to a remote machine from your local host, you would put in an IP or a port. Um, so there's all different you know, configurations that you can add to that. But if you're just running on your laptop, which is what I would recommend for now, is just h2o.init. And there's a couple ways to get data into R. So in our hands-on, I'll show you the other way, but generally the, mo the more efficient way is to just read directly from disk into the H2O cluster. So when you do that, you don't actually make a copy of the data in R. So the goal would be, you know, reduce copies if you, if you can. So if you have the data on disk as a CSV file or if it's in an HDFS um, location or an S3 location or if it's in a database, there's all different places that your data can be read directly into H2O. This is obviously just the most common or the easiest to talk about would be, you know, reading from a CSV. So we just have an h2o.import file. That's the same thing as like read CSV or, you know, things you're familiar with. Um, and so train would just be, you know, your training data. And um, you don't have to split the data or do anything. We'll, we'll do that for you. You can be more um, specific about how you want to split the training and the validation frame and things like that if you choose to. But um, essentially, you just have to pass it the training frame, and then at the very least, you have to tell it what the response column is, is called. So um, that's the why argument. And if you want to use just a subset of the columns as predictors, then you could also pass the x argument. Otherwise, it'll just use everything that's not the response, and it will assume that's a predictor. And then um, how, H2, or how the AutoML function works is you, you have to tell it how long you want it to run for. Um, so you either tell it in time, so you say run for a certain amount of time and then stop, or you could say um, run for a certain number of models. So maybe you wanna just start with 20 models or 50 models. And you know, how long that takes obviously depends on the size of your data and the resources that you give it. So, you know, um, Two different so, ways, yeah. Yeah, so, so what I would say is, I mean, literally, like if you just remember this line of code, h2o.automl, and then with the parameters that Aaron has in there, and this is why it's so efficient for a data scientist because you can leverage h2o to help you out getting, to, getting all of these different algorithms to take a look at your data and come up with some models that you can investigate further that way you can really spend the bulk of your time up front in the process, which is actually doing data engineering, coming up with better features, really analyzing the problem, um, and trying to do things that will, before you get to machine learning, help you out, and then leverage H2O to kind of do the rest, or, or at least a, a subset of that piece, which is the machine learning part. 
Yeah, and you can you can do this in an iterative fashion as well. So you can start, let's say, you, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. So you might want to just run it for 10 models. And then you can restart it and run it for another 10 or another 20 or 50 models or, you know, same thing with, with time. Um, so you don't have to restart from scratch each time. Um, so, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over to the R code. So I'm actually not totally done with the presentation or the slides, but we're going to skip over. And just for the Python people that might be listening, we are going to talk, oh, I'm just going to show you the Python API after this as well. So you don't have to feel left out. Yeah. And, and, um, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. What I was going to say is, and for the Python people, we are working on a Python course that's going to use H2O in it as well. So that piece that, that Aaron just showed, we're going to be implementing that <clears throat> or something similar to that. Yeah. Okay. So guys, these questions are piling up. How about we, we maybe answer one or two and then, uh, sure. and then do, do the code. So, um, this is a combination of a couple of questions, but um, is H2O planning to include automated feature engineering or creating new independent variables? I think this may go into the data processing roadmap you talked about. Um, yeah, so some of the things that I mentioned are, are stuff that we'll do. So in the next version of H2O 3.24, we'll have automatic target encoding. So that is is a form of automated feature engineering right there because you're engineering new representations of existing features. Um, if we do uh, feature extraction, that just means taking, you know, usually a wide data set and condensing it down. So doing dimensionality reduction, that's a form of feature engineering. Um, yeah, so there, there's, there's stuff that would be called automated feature engineering, but there's also, um, as I mentioned before, we have a product called driverless AI, which is entirely focused on automated feature engineering. So as long as <laughs> there's at least one less, uh, one fewer like exciting thing in the open source than that, then I think that, you know, that's, that's stuff that we'll, we'll try to add in. Okay. So we'll do one more. There, a lot of these questions are very specific, so we'll try to mm -hmm. answer them at the end. But um, I think this is a good one uh, from Matesh. He says, are complex ensembles actually used in production, although these models would help in improving the leaderboard score in competitions, um, wouldn't deploying them at production level be a little tricky? Um, it depends what your needs are. So if you are um, the type of business where you have to make predictions on like a nanosecond level. So if you're, you know, placing ads on a website, for example, um, that's something that needs to be done extremely fast and you don't have the data until you, you need to make the prediction. So, you know, that in that case, I, you know, in industry, people just use a GLM a lot of the time. However, if you're making, um, making predictions that, I mean, H2O is very fast, so it depends like on a few things. Are you making all the base learner predictions in parallel? Well, if you can do that, then it's not that much extra time to do an ensemble. But if you have it set up so that you have to do one after the other and you're gonna do like 50 models and then make predictions from those and then do the ensemble prediction, then it will be slower. Um, so it depends on the use case, but certainly people use ensembles in production um, for sure. I, I would say that the training piece is generally speaking the, the thing that takes long, the actual prediction part. So once you have a model already produced, then that yeah. prediction time is usually really relatively low. Yeah, it's pretty fast. So it, it just depends like if, if you're dealing with really like sub millisecond, like prediction response time requirements or not. And because, because it, it does take a little bit longer to make an ensemble prediction, but if that's within your range of acceptable um, delay, then there's no reason not to use an ensemble. Okay, let's jump into the code because I know people are eager to see that. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, <clears throat> all right, so we're going to use this marketing analytics data that um, that you guys showed last 
uh, webinar. Um, and these are the, the three libraries that we'll need. Tidyverse, it's, um, it's in an Excel file, so we're gonna need the read Excel package and we'll need the H2O. Oh, just, uh, just real quick, sorry, yeah. Aaron. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanna make sure in order to be able to get the latest features, make sure you install the latest version of H2O either on yes. following the instructions on their website or uh, installing from what's called CRAN. Um, and I think there's some instru instructions at the top that shows you how to do that. Yeah, so just install packages H2O or if you're using R Studio, you can go here and type it in like that. And that will give you the latest stable version. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, so what I did before this call was actually run the AutoML because I was planning to run it and then go back to my slides and then, you know, wait for it to run. But then I thought it's better just to have it in memory. So, um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show, go through the code to just show you the data. And then I'm gonna pull up the, the leaderboard for the AutoML that I, that I ran you know, 30 minutes ago or an hour ago. Okay, so this is just code. This is exactly copied from the last session. So this is not actually even code that I wrote, but basically you're reading in a number of different sheets in an Excel workbook. And then each of the sheets contains some data about uh, a particular ID. So yeah, I think um, it's sheets four through seven, which I'm not sure which. Yeah, like that loan history okay. has an ID to it. Yep. Yeah. Client info. So, so yeah, so it's, these are IDs of, of clients, I guess. So, um, and then because each table has a little bit more information about each ID, then we can join them together. And that's what this VLOOKUP would be the Excel term for this. But we join that together and then what we get is something that looks like this. So ID column, and now we have a bunch of things that we could consider to be predictors for a machine learning problem. Um, you can't see the last two columns, so term deposit is actually the thing that we're gonna try to predict, and that's a binary um, outcome. And there's things, demographic data, age, job, marital status, education, et cetera. Um, so let's do that. Okay, and so <clears throat> now that we have the data kind of situated, we're gonna start the H2O cluster. When I do that, I'm already running it, so it, when, I, when I say h2o.init, it will just connect to my cluster that's already been running for uh, one hour and eight minutes. And um, it'll give you some other information. So this is the H2O version, so then you know right away which version you're using. Um, the memory that we give to H2O is by default in our four gigs. So if you wanted to change that, you would go max mem size equals, you know, 10 gigs or however much you need. And you might not be familiar with that, and that might be something you're not used to thinking about um, memory. Um, so essentially, we have kind of a rule of thumb in H2O is like you need between three and four times the amount of memory in RAM than the size of your data on disk. So, however, in this case, we're running a lot of models, so you might need more than that. Um, it's really not something to think about until something doesn't work, and then you just give it more memory, or, you know, so, on so a laptop, it, you know, you can go probably up to 12 or 14 gigs. And, and actually, this is a good point, Aaron, because in the last uh, webinar, one of the things that was happening in Excel was it was crashing at, I think, like six megabytes or seven megabytes. The VLOOKUP wouldn't even, I mean, it just kind of gives you that crazy spinning wheel for an hour. Um, so yeah. this, we're talking gigs of memory here. You know, so if we've got a data set that's, I don't know, seven megabytes, uh, you giving it four gigs of memory is, going to be no problem. Yeah. So most of the time, you know, if you have really big data, then you're probably already thinking about things like memory. So, um, but in the most, most cases, you know, most normal business data that you pull out of a database somewhere is probably not huge. Um, so another thing to point out, so 
by default, it will use all the cores that it has available. So on this laptop, we have eight cores. Um, let's see, localhost means I'm just running it locally. And then at this port, this is uh, where we're running. Um, well, it's just the port that H2O is running on. And it's also, if you type in localhost colon 54321, into your browser, you'll come up, uh, that'll bring up the uh, web interface to H2O. Um, and anytime the H2O cluster is, is running, that web interface is, is also running. So if I wanted to, I could pull that up right now. Okay. So next, we're going to do a little bit of data prep. So um, one thing uh, that machine learning algorithms like is to understand what, what do the columns mean. So typically, at least in R, there's sort of an aversion to using, at least in certain uh, populations of the R community, there's sort of this anti-string or anti-factor mentality and people like strings. And so, uh, and people didn't like that data frames, you know, automatically convert strings to factors. This is a big point of contention among a lot of people. However, machine learning algorithms like to know, uh, so, if you're not familiar with factor, there's lots of different terms that mean the same thing. So in R, we call it like a factor. Uh, the more English version would be a categorical variable. Um, the Java version is called enum. Um, so all of these things mean the same thing. And, and all that it means is that there's some set amount of values that the column can take. And with strings, it could, it could be anything. It could be each string could be different from the last. Where um, with factors, the, the idea is generally like you have some small set of options. Let's say like a state um, that you live in in the U.S., for example, um, or a month of the year. There's only twelve of those. So machine learning uh, algorithms generally like to know if if things are factors because that's meaningful to them. It means something. Whereas string doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, and Python so, and yeah. Python pandas, I believe it's called <laughs> categorical. So uh, mm. it's it's just a categorical variable. Um, so you're, so instead of being a string, which is text, uh, converting it to a, a categorical, which is in R called a factor. Yeah. So what we'll notice here is that a lot a lot of the or actually all of the ones that are made of text are actually characters right now. And so we're just going to convert them to factors because then machine learning algorithms will know that they should be used and it will understand the number of categories and things like that. So now if we look at this again, we'll see factor, 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 factor. Anyway, <clears throat> that's just a small step um, that we do. And then, so this is the other way to get data into H2O. So, um, before I showed you on the screen, it was the import data from CSV. Um, if you already have a data frame or a data table or a tibble in R and you want it to be converted into an H2O frame, and so that, that's the required input for, for H2O uh, machine learning algorithms, then you just use this as H2O function. And what this function actually does, um, <clears throat> because this data is sitting in R memory, the only way to get it into the Java memory is actually to write it to disk and then to read it back into the H2O cluster using the same import file functionality. So if you have a very, very large data set and it takes a long time to write it to disk, um, you can use this, uh, this speed up option here. So it'll just use data table fwrite and fread. Um, instead of the default NR. So we don't want to have a dependency on data table. So we don't, actually have this turned on by default. Um, we actually might change that. I think we are in the process of changing that. But anyway, this is just a note. If you have really, really big data, you wanna use this option. It'll be much faster. All right, so now, now that it's an H2O frame, let's take a look at um, what it looks like. This is just the printout of what we would see in H2O. So these are the same variables here. It's just sort of in the reverse orientation. Um, so it will say the type. So again, enum is the Java word for factor, categorical. 
and it will give you some other um, interesting information. So if it's numeric, it will calculate, you know, um, min, max, mean, um, uh, standard error, uh, the number of zeros. So some of this is interesting for like debugging your data. If there's any missing values, that'll show up here. Cardinality is useful. That's something I usually look at right away to see if there's any issues, um, like variables that have, you know, a very large number of um, levels. So it looks everything's pretty reasonable here. The biggest one is a month is the month, which has 12 levels. We got that ID feature in there too, which I mean, as we all yeah. know, ID is a unique feature. So you're going to want to get rid of that before we do the, the machine learning. Right. So in this case, we're going to have to pull that out because we don't want it to be in there because it's not predictive. And if it is predictive, you're probably dealing with some sort of data leakage issue. So you always pretty much want to remove ID columns unless it's some sort of cluster ID. So unique ID columns you always want to get rid of. All right. And so if you remember what the interface looks like, we're going to need to define Y and X in the training frame. So Y is just the either the name or the index of the response variable. So that's just called term deposit. And X, um, in this case, we need to define X because we're actually going to remove one of the variables, the ID column. So we're going to grab all the, um, all the column names and we're going to remove Y and the ID and then that will give us exactly the predictors that we want to use. And then here we, we have a few extra things set. So project name, you don't need to set that. It'll set it automatically, but just kind of for verbosity, I'm setting it here. And then it's always good to set a seed, I think. Um, you don't have to though. And then we would run it for 10 models. And then it's um, the training set is called train. So actually turns out I ran this before, so it's already saved. So that this AML object is already saved in memory. Um, and what we're going to look at now is the leaderboard. So I'm just going to save that as a little object called LB. It's really just a data frame. Technically, it's an H2O frame. But um, so if we print the leaderboard, we're just going to get a snapshot of, of what's there. Um, but let's, let's print the whole thing because we want to see all the rows just because, uh oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to do this. Um, <laughs> There's always something. Yeah, I, I sh yeah, it's a bad idea. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the leaderboard, and what we see is we have model ID column, and then we have uh, metrics that represent the cross-validated uh, performance of each of the models. So... Uh, this is a binary classification problem, so we have um, all the metrics that we offer in H2O that we calculate automatically. So that would be AUC, log loss, mean per class error, um, RMSE, and MSE. And what you see now is the um, stacked ensemble all models is winning with the AUC of 0.9372. And this is kind of a standard thing that we see. So it's not always the case that the leaderboard looks like, like this, but um, typically we see the all models uh, stacked ensemble winning with the best of family a little bit behind. And then probably one of our, um, so in addition to doing the grid search on a bunch of different algorithms, we actually hard code specific models into our um, AutoML process that we know to be like generally a set of parameters that gives a good model. And so this XGBoost 1 is, is one that we just, you know, think is good. And you can look at what the parameters are. Um, actually, we'll, we'll grab it in a minute, but let's, um, let's just move on to the next piece of code. Should I ask if there's any questions now about the code so far? Um, there's a lot of questions, <laughs> but I, I don't really want to get too distracted away from the coding part because, um, okay. it may throw people off. So we should probably get through what's left. Okay. So what we've done so far is basically most of what you would typically do in AutoML. So I have a little bit of extra code that's just there, you know, 
because it's kind of interesting. So if we wanted to look a little bit more into what, what is the ensemble doing, we can, um, what we can do is we can look at the variable importance for the meta-learning algorithm inside of the stack ensemble. So what does that mean? So the meta-learner is the name of the algorithm, which is, um, its goal is to take the predictions from the base models and to predict the outcome. So the features in the meta-learner are actually predictions from the base model. So the features represent each of the models that are um, in the stacked ensemble. So if we run this code here, oh gosh, I've totally screwed this up, but. Um, I was gonna say, <laughs> I'm, hold on. I broke it from running it twice. Okay, so <laughs> what we'll do, we'll see if any of this works. Uh, Okay, so there's some error message that's plaguing me, but let me see if this code works. Okay, so what we did was we grabbed the meta learner, which is a, a model stored inside the stacked ensemble. And in this case, it's a GLM. It could be any type of machine learning algorithm, but um, uh, hey, what, the default is GLM. Yeah. I was going to say, why don't you let me show my screen? Because I have it running here too. Okay, yeah. Okay, so if you just want to stop share and I will transition right over to mine. Okay, all right. Just, just so, a heads up, we're 10 after, just to give you a time check. Okay, cool. So yeah, for, for anyone who has to drop off, no big deal. Um, we're gonna be recording this, so don't worry about it. And for those that can stay, we're gonna continue on. Okay, so this is that piece of code that Aaron was running. And Aaron, if you just wanna kinda talk me through what to do. Yeah, so I so I think that code was was running just fine. So if you want to just uh, run the the three lines of code to grab the meta learner and then okay, um, okay, we got the meta learner and then maybe and then, and then we just saw like basically what we're looking at is variable importance for the meta learner. So if you want to bring up either the plot or the table, or okay. Both. So the table would be this line of code, right? Yep. Okay. So what that, what that shows is it's basically showing how important each of the base learners is to the ensemble. And we'll see basically everything, you know, the XGBoost number one is, is the most important. And, um, you know, following that is XRT stands for extremely randomized trees. So that's just a variant of random forest. Um, and then the DRF is the distributed random forest. And then there's another XGBoost. GBM is just the H2O implementation of GBM. So at, at some point, I think it was one or two versions of H2O Go, we integrated XGBoost into H2O um, because it's a very good algorithm and we you know, saw a lot of value from doing that. So now that you know, it's in H2O, we can also put it inside of AutoML. So when you see GBM, that's actually the H2O GBM, which sometimes does better than XGBoost, but a lot of times XGBoost wins, so um, yeah. And you'll see at the bottom, the last model there is the GLM, which is not doing very well, and uh, which we saw in the leaderboard, but, um, but actually it's com being completely ignored by the, the ensemble. So the coefficient is zero. So, you know, so the lesson here is basically you can put bad models in so you don't, have to sit and sort of pick apart which models should go in the stacked ensemble. The goal with the meta learner is to ignore anything that's not useful. And so that's what you see is happening here. And then there's some XGBoost model number two, which is also seeming to be not very good. Um, oh, this one bottom, right here. Which is, which is almost ignored. So Matt, people are having a hard time seeing your uh, screen is too small. Okay, so let me do this. Any better? Yeah, maybe uh, maybe scroll the the right side panels over just to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How is that? Any better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe font size just a little bigger. Okay. Try one more. How okay. is that? Yeah, that's nice. Okay. So I think we were right here. Okay. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm running the code myself too, and it's 
looking fine. I had some issues with the plotting before because my screen was too big, but I, if we wanted to switch back over, okay. I could just show you the last thing from the code. Sure, um, take it away. All right, so let's do share again, desktop. Okay, so I just wanted to show one last thing. So, you know, I thought it's just kind of interesting to look inside of the stacked ensemble and see how it's evaluating the models itself. But, um, but then, you know, one thing we might want to look at is just regular variable importance for on the original training set itself. So we could just grab one of the XGBoost models, like the first one from the leaderboard. So if you use this line of code, we're just grabbing from the model IDs the first thing that's called XGBoost and grabbing that model. And then we can print the, the variable importance here. And then it might actually just be easier to look um, in the plot. So, so duration is by far the most predictive variable. Um, so that's, that's always interesting when you have one variable that kind of shoots out above the rest. And then what you still see here is, um, so this is one of the variables, P outcome, but then this is also one of the levels inside of this categorical variable. So the fact that they were having a success value is actually very important, more important than some other values that are not showing up here. Yeah, um, and this is where the business leaders are really gonna get a lot of value out of your algorithm. So not only does it predict well, but it tells them that, oh, duration. Well, duration is how long you had them on the call. So if the duration is very long, you know, they're going to be more likely to be um, uh, a, a probability of success. The same thing with P outcome. So the P outcome is your previous outcome. And if they've previously, you know, bought a product from the bank uh, or enrolled in a product and that's been successful, then they're way more likely in the future to be successful of, of enrolling in that product. So this is, this is a lot of good information. Yeah, so this can be used to you know, adjust business processes or things like that and it's just pretty informative um, information to have. And it, and it also actually um, parallels really well with the correlation plot that we showed last time because I think duration and then the P outcome uh, success were the, the two features that really jumped out at us from that correlation plot. Yeah, and after that, things you know, are a little bit more, everything's kind of all on the same level. And then the ones that are, I guess, I guess not shown are uh, not, not very important. So if we go back here, um, so this has actually all the, all of the variables with each of their levels, um, you know, in this table here. And so basically if they're so small, they're not showing up here, but um, yeah, so that's basically the code, but this is all sort of post-processing stuff that you can do later. The, the real meat of it is just running, running this and, you know, looking at the leaderboard. Yeah. So what, what I like to say is um, this is like the reason it's such a big, productivity boost is because you can literally let AutoML run and you come up with these awesome models that um, help you out so much in literally just minutes rather than spending days working on machine learning algorithms, testing, you know, every part of the process, doing a cross validation, doing all the stuff that like really takes you away from doing the important stuff, which is understanding the business process working with get, uh, teams to get more data, to get you know, better uh, predictors and, and those sorts of things. So it really enables you to be more of an asset to your company, in my opinion. Yeah, so I just thought of one thing that's not in the script that I wanted to show. So once you have this model, you obviously wanna maybe know what, what, what were the parameters that were selected or, or used in this model. So now that I had this this object called XGB, which is just the top XGBoost model, I can look at the parameters that were set. So some of the stuff is not useful, like number of folds, et cetera, et cetera. But now if we scroll down, we'll, we'll see things that are more interesting, like the number of trees. So that's not very many trees, um, you know, so it was obviously good to stop early before we overfit on this data. 
Um, that's the max depth, the min rows, the learning rate, the sample rate. Um, so these are all interesting things to look at. And so if you're uh, more of, let's say, an expert data scientist, you could take the best model that you found in the leaderboard, which is this one here, and then kind of examine it and think to yourself, okay, based on what I see here, is there something else that I could try? Maybe I want to try the same model, but with like max depth 35 or min rows five, or, you know, just, you can start to manually tweak as well. So you, even if you consider yourself an expert, you can use AutoML as a, a baseline or a starting point, and then your goal would be to beat it. You know, that would be, um, you know. I think, I, think, I think that's what probably most data scientists do once they get pretty comfortable with doing the AutoML, then they mm -hmm. take it to that next step of actually building their own algorithms using the ones that AutoML come up with and then kind of try and improve on them. Yeah, and I mean, you could even do your own ensembles or, you know, do whatever kind of creative process you have. Um, <clears throat> so I have a few more slides. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I'll maybe spend a couple more minutes. I just wanted to show the, the Python API. Basically, exactly the same arguments. Um, it's just one difference is that you specify the AutoML object first and then you execute the train method on that. So two lines of code instead of one. Um, but that's essentially what it looks like. And then for people who don't want to write code or you know, have a broken arm or something, <laughs> they're just tired, um, this is the flow interface <clears throat> in which you can totally do everything point and click. You can upload the data point and click. You can select it, and then you can tweak any of the um, parameters for AutoML that you want, but typically you could just leave them. One thing I should mention, and this is in my follow-up slide of like pro tips for AutoML, is we have a default of one hour on AutoML. So this is to kind of prevent, uh, I don't know, AutoML from taking all your budget on EC2 or something accidentally. So, um, so it will cut itself off after one hour unless you change that argument. So that's called max runtime. So, so yeah, if you, if you put it for a hundred models and somehow it only gets to 10 and maybe that took an hour, you have to remember, oh, you know, I forgot to unlimit the, the time. So let me add some more time to that. And this, we've seen a leaderboard already, but this is an example of a leaderboard. Um, so these are just some pro tips. You can actually turn on and off different algorithms. So there's an exclude algos argument. So if you know for sure you don't want to use GBMs for some reason or deep learning or GLM, you can turn on and off particular algorithms. Um, you can't turn off particular models at this point, although that's a thing that we would like to add in the future to have it more fully customizable. Um, I warned you about this already. It'll stop after an hour unless you increase the limit. And if you want reproducibility, um, the way to get that is to use max models because with runtime that will not necessarily be the same from time to time how much you can accomplish in that time period. So you would have to use max models, you have to use a seed, and um, you actually, deep learning in H2O is never reproducible unless it's on one core and that would be very slow. So if you 100% um, need reproducibility, you can turn off deep learning, you can switch that off, um, or you can be satisfied with that most of the models are reproducible except for deep learning. And then of course, the ensemble would also not be reproducible if it's using deep learning. Um, and then just a reminder that all the, the models will be stored in the H2 cluster. So if you're gonna run it for a thousand models or something like that, you are gonna have to have enough memory to store all those models. And unfortunately, I can't give you like an easy way to come up with that number, like what, what number, because it's all dependent on the size of your data, the size of your machine, et cetera. Um, so there's not an easy way to do that. But mm -hmm. then afterwards, so this is just a picture of the future of data science. Um, yeah. yeah, we were laughing about that picture earlier because like really that's what <laughs> automated machine learning is kind of turning. So don't show this picture to your bosses, uh, yeah. but, but honestly, it's really um, freeing you up to focus on what you're gonna be more, uh, which, which is more value uh, in my opinion, which is on working with people 
um, to develop those data sets and get the best predictors rather than spending all of your time on the machine learning piece which is honestly just, you know, kind of going through and, and doing this um, process of finding the best models and, and aggregating them. So H2O takes care of that for you. Yeah. So um, I'm going to probably just skip over this, this last stuff here so that we have a little bit more time for questions. But these are just, you know, if you review the slides later, just some tips and tricks if you feel that you're not getting enough models, it might be doing early stopping and you might have to tweak some of those parameters or turn that off. Um, if you wanna extend the, like run it, run it once and then for 10 models and then run it again. Um, one thing you have to do if you want stacked ensembles the second time is you would actually have to turn on this keep cross validation predictions argument to true because um, if you don't have that, then Stacked Ensemble doesn't have what it needs to build uh, more ensembles later, um, which I realized yesterday. Uh, I think we might change that default. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, and then, of course, if you run it again, you want to change the seed. Otherwise, it might give you some duplicate models. Um, and this is just some longer references that you can look at. So this is this is the docs page, so the user guide for AutoML, and then we have longer um, tutorials in R and Python that you can um, visit. And these are just, again, just resources that you could look at later, but these are all links to all of our different uh, places on the internet which are useful. And if you want to contribute to H2O, it's open source, there's options for that. And then this is my contact information. Um, and so now I think we'll just see how much time we want to spend on questions. Um, just real quick, I do want to um, extend an offer though uh, for those who want to learn H2O, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me, how do I, um, oh, do you mind stopping sharing, Aaron? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And I will just share my screen really quickly. Okay, so what do I have going on? Um, okay, cool. So thank you so much, Aaron. I think um, we all see how H2O is just an awesome solution to really making us more productive. Uh, literally like three or four lines of code and you go from having a data set to having machine learning models. Um, really what I want to do is I want to show you guys um, how I recommend learning this. And we actually, that's, that's one of the reasons that we built the second course in our system. So we've got a three course system that's all integrated. Uh, the first course is the beginning, um, which is your foundations. The second course is the machine learning and business consulting. And that's what I'm gonna focus on because that's where we show you how to use H2O. And then the third course um, then takes the models that you build in the second course and converts those into a shiny app. So that also kind of integrates the H2O piece into that as well. So. Just real quick, um, in that second course, uh, which is kind of the advanced machine learning and business consulting course, in chapters four and five, we teach H2O. And uh, in chapter four, it's modeling, where you'll generate 30 plus uh, model leaderboard, and then you'll visualize the results in ggplot too. <clears throat> and then in chapter five, we go over performance. So this is a binary classification problem uh, where you're examining attrition. You're gonna go through all of the uh, performance metrics like ROC, AUC, precision recall, and gain and lift plots, which are very important for assessing models. And then um, what the business really cares about and the thing that you um, it makes, it's kind, of, it's kind of tough, especially with stacked ensembles and some of these more black box models is being able to explain that to business leaders. And that's what we teach you how in chapter, uh, actually I think that should be chapter seven, but it's explaining black, black box models. And we do that with a, an algorithm called Lime. So we'll, we'll teach you how to cr create Lime charts to explain what's going on in the model. Um, the last piece there, we develop a recommendation algorithm that's tuned uh, for uh, business ROI. So it's expected value. Uh, we want to show how much money you're going to be able to save that company. And I believe in, in the cloak course, we show um, a model that's going to save um, something like $5 million for the company. And then um, the third course in the series is the Shiny Web App. We then show you how to implement that into a web app that business leaders can use um, so they can interact with your models in a more 
uh, in a way that they're more accustomed to with a, a, a web-based dashboard. Okay, so that is kind of the, um, the, the plan. If you really wanna learn H2O, I'm telling you guys, this is gonna be the way to do it. It's um, a system that honestly, I wish I had back in the day when I was first starting. Um, we have a promotional code available to you today. It's learning labs, all one word, lowercase, and that'll get, that'll get you 15% off, and you can use that on the first two courses. The Shiny course is coming next month or early April at the latest. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. Uh, learning Labs, just remember that, 15% off. All right, now we have time for questions. Uh, yeah, th there's <laughs> I've answered somewhere around 15 to 20 questions, and we still have 31. <laughs> so, oh, wow, okay. Yeah. But I didn't really want to interrupt because um, some of the questions take would probably take a little bit to answer, I mean, thoroughly, and yep. it would take away from the content of the presentation. So being respectful um, of getting through Aaron's slides, and uh, I don't know. I think what we should probably do, Matt, is, is take some of the – some of these, there's a lot of overlap between the questions. Maybe we can take some of the more popular ones. Well, let's yeah, let's handle some of the questions maybe in the email that we send out uh, yeah, with that's what I was gonna suggest. to the resources and to the recording. Right. Yeah. And that way we're also respectful with people's time because we're an hour and a half in. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So sorry, guys. I know I know a lot of you have some some very specific questions. And if Matt or I cannot answer them, um, we'll see if Aaron can answer a specific one. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll handle them. Yeah, we'll, we'll handle them through the email. Um, yeah. So we, we won't let them go. We'll, we'll definitely get you an answer. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thanks for tuning in. It's been uh, a pleasure seeing everybody for another week. And um, this was a long one, so I hope you enjoyed it. And it was a good one, though. It was a really yeah, good one. It was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And all of the code, um, any resource links, uh, the slide decks will all be put in an email and, and sent out to everyone within the next day or two. Yeah. And Aaron, I really want to thank you for being a guest on here. Um, honestly, whenever you want to come back, just let us know because uh, it was a pleasure having you. And H2O, I'm a huge fan. I've been a fan for a while. That's why I created the, the second level of the course. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me.